Each time the singer paused, Odysseus wiped tears, drew down the cloak, and poured a splash of wine out of his goblet for the gods. But each time the Phaeacian nobles urged the bard to sing again, they loved his songs. So he would start again. Odysseus would moan and hide his head behind his cloak. Only Alcinos could see his tears, since he was sitting next to him and heard his sobbing. So he quickly spoke. My lords, we have already satisfied our wish for feasting, and the lyre, and the feast's companion. Now let us go outside and set up contests in every sport, so when our guest goes home he can tell all his friends we are the best. Many young athletes stood there, including the three sons of great Alcinus, Laudanus, godlike Clytonius, and Talius. First came the foot race. They lined up, then dashed all in an instant right around the track. Clytonius was the best by far at sprinting. Next came the brutal sport of wrestling, in which Euryalus was the best. In jumping, Amphiolus excelled, and at the discus, by far the best was Elatrius. The prince Laudamus excelled at boxing. They all enjoyed the games. When they were over, Laudamus, Alcinus's son, said, Now, my friends, we ought to ask the stranger if he plays any sports. His build is strong, his legs and arms and neck are very sturdy, and he is in his prime. Though he has been broken by suffering, no pain can shake a man as badly as the sea, however strong he may have once have been. Euryolus replied, You are quite right, Laudamus. Why not call out to challenge him yourself? The noble son Alcinus agreed with him. He stood up in the middle of the mall and called Odysseus. Come, friend, he said. Now you, sir, you should try our games as well, if you know any sports. It seems you would. Nothing can be more glorious for a man in a whole lifetime than what he achieves with hands and feet. So try, set care aside. Soon you will travel, since your ship is launched, the crew is standing by. Odysseus thought carefully. He had a plan. He answered, Laudamus, why mock me with this challenge? My heart is set on sorrow, not on games since I have suffered and endure so much that now I only want to get back home. I sit here praying to your king and people to grant my wish. Euryolus responded with outright taunting. Stranger, I suppose you must be ignorant of all athletics. I know your type. The captain of a crew of merchant sailors. You roam around at sea and only care about your freight and cargo, keeping close watch on your ill-gotten gains. You are no athlete.
With a scowl, he answered, What crazed arrogance from you, stranger? The gods do not bless everyone the same, with equal gifts of body, mind, or speech. One man is weak, but gods may crown his words with loveliness. Men gladly look to him. His speech is steady, with calm dignity. He stands out from his audience, and when he walks through town, the people look at him as if he were a god. Another man has godlike looks, but no grace in his words. Like you, you look impressive, and a god could not improve your body. But your mind is crippled. You have stirred my heart to anger with these outrageous comments. I am not lacking experience of sports and games. When I was young, I trusted my strong arms and was among the first. Now pain has crushed me. I have endured the agonies of war and struggled through the dangers of the sea. But you have challenged me and stung my heart. Despite my suffering, I will compete. With that he leapt up, cloak and all, and seized a massive discus, heavier than that used by the others. He spun around, drew back his arm, and from his brawny hand he hurled. The stone went humming. The Phaeacians, known for rowing, ducked down, cowering beneath its arc. It flew beyond the other pigs. Athena marked the spot. In human guise, she spoke. A blind man, stranger, could discern this mark by groping. It is far ahead of all the others. You may celebrate. You won this round, and none of them will ever throw further. Or as far. Odysseus was thrilled to realize he had a friend to take his side, and with a lighter heart he told the young Phaeacians, Try to match this. If you can do it, I will throw another as far or farther. You have made me greatly incensed, so I will take you on in any sport. Come now. In boxing, wrestling, or sprinting, I will compete with anyone. Except Laudamus. He is my host. Who would fight with a friend? A man who challenges those who have welcomed him in a strange land is worthless and a fool. He spites himself. But I will challenge any of you others. Test my ability. Let me know yours. I am not weak at any sport men practice. I know the way to hold a polished bow. I always was the first to hit my man out of a horde of enemies, though many comrades stood by me, arrows taking aim. And I can throw a spear beyond the shots that others reach with arrows. I am only concerned that one of you may win the foot race. I lost my stamina and my legs weakened during my time at sea upon the raft. I could not do my exercise.
The crowd was silent, but Alcina said, Sir, you have expressed with fine good manners. You wish to show your talents, and your anger at the man who stood up in this arena and mocked you, as no one who understands how to speak properly would ever do. Let someone bring the well-tuned lyre from inside for Demodocus. Go, quickly. A slave boy ran quickly at his bidding, and returned shortly thereafter with the blind poet, who sat down with his lyre well within reach. A god inspired the bard to sing. He started with how the Greeks set fire to their camp and then embarked and sailed away. Meanwhile, Odysseus brought in a gang of men into the heart of Troy, inside the horse. The Trojans pulled the thing up to the summit and sat around discussing what to do. Some said, We ought to strike the wood with swords. Others said, Drag it higher up and hurl it down from the rocks. But some said they should leave it to pacify the gods. So it would be. The town was doomed to ruin when it took that horse, chock full of fighters bringing death to the Trojans. And he sang how the Achaeans poured forth from the horse, in ambush from the hollow, and sacked the city. How they scattered out, destroying every neighborhood. Like Ares, Odysseus, with Menelaus, rushed to find Diphobus's house, and there he won at last, through dreadful violence, thanks to Athena. So the poet sang. Odysseus was melting into tears. His cheeks were wet with weeping. No one noticed that his eyes were wet with tears except Alcinas, who sat right next to him and heard his sobs. Quickly he spoke to his seafaring people, Listen to my words, lords and nobles of Phaeacia. Demodocus should stop and set aside the lyre, since what he sings does not give pleasure to everyone. Throughout his heavenly song since dinner time, our guest has been in pain, grieving. A heavy burden weighs his heart. Let the song end so we can all be happy, both guests and hosts. That would be best by far. This send-off party and these precious gifts which we give out of friendship are for him, our guest of honor. Any man of sense will treat a guest in need like his own brother. Stranger, now answer all my questions clearly, not with evasion. Frankness would be best. What did your parents name you? With what name are you known to your people? Surely no one in all the world is nameless, poor or noble, since parents give a name to every child at birth. And also tell me of your country, your people, and your city, so our ships, steered by their own good sense, may take you there. Come now, tell me about your wanderings. Describe the places, the people, and the cities you have seen. Which ones were wild and cruel, unwelcoming, and which were kind to visitors, respecting the gods? And please explain why you were weeping, sobbing your heart out when you heard him sing what happened to the Greeks at Troy. 
The gods devised and measured out this devastation to make a song for those in times to come. Did you lose someone at Troy? A man from your wife's family? Perhaps her father or brother? Ties of marriage are the closest after the bonds of blood. Or perhaps you lost a friend who knew you best of all. A friend can be as close as any brother. Book Nine Wily Odysseus, the Lord of Lies, answered, My Lord Alcinus, great king, now something prompted you to ask of my own sad story. I will tell you, though the memory increases my despair. Where shall I start? Where can I end? The gods have given me so much to weep over. First I will tell my name, so we will be acquainted, and if I survive you can be my guest in my distant home one day. I am Odysseus, Laertes' son, known for many clever tricks and lies. My fame extends to heaven, but I live in Ithaca, where shaking forest hides Mount Neriton. Close by are other islands, Delicium and wooded Zacynthus and Same. All the others face the dawn. My Ithaca is set apart, most distant facing the dark. It is a rugged land, but good at rearing children. To my eyes no country could be sweeter. When a man is far from home, living abroad, there is no sweeter thing than his own native land and family. Now let me tell you all the trouble Zeus has caused me on my journey home from Troy. A blast of wind pushed me off course towards the Sicones and Ismaris. I sacked the town and killed the men. We took their wives and shared their riches equally among us. Then I said we must run away. Those fools refused to listen. They were drinking wine excessively and killing sheep and cattle along the beach. The Sicones called out to neighbors on the mainland who were strong and numerous, and skilled at horseback fighting, and if need be, on foot. They came like leaves and blossoms in the spring at dawn. Then Zeus gave us bad luck. Oh, those poor men. The enemy assembled round the ships and fought with swords of bronze, and while the holy morning light was bright and strong, we held them off, though they outnumbered us. But when the sun turned round and dipped, the Skykones began to overpower us Greeks. Six well-armed members of my crew died from each ship. The rest of us survived, and we escaped the danger. We prepared to sail away with grieving hearts, relieved to be alive, but our hearts heavy for our friends. The Cloud Lord Zeus hurled north wind at our ships, a terrible typhoon, and covered up the sea and earth with fog.
Night fell from heavens and seized us and our ships keeled over. The sails were ripped three times by blasting wind. Scared for our lives, we hoisted down the sails and rowed with all our might towards the shore. We stayed there for two days and nights, exhausted, eating our hearts with pain. When bright hair dawn brought the third morning, we set up our masts, unfurled the shining sails, and climbed aboard. The wind blew straight, the pilot steered, and I would have come safely home to my own land. But as I rounded Malia, a current and a blast of wind pushed me off course, away from Scythra. For nine days I was swept by stormy winds along the Fishfield Sea. On the tenth day, I landed on the island of those who live on food from luscious lotus. We gathered water, and my crew prepared a meal. We picnicked by the ships. Then I chose two men and one slave to make the third to go and scout. We needed to find out what kind of people lived here on this land. The scouts encountered humans, lotus eaters, who did not hurt them. They simply shared with them their sweet, delicious fruit. But as they ate it, they lost the will to come back and bring news to me. They wanted only to stay there, feeding on lotus with the lotus eaters. They had forgotten home. I dragged them back in tears forced them on board the hollow ships, pushed them below the decks and tied them up. I told the other men, the loyal ones, to get back in the ships so no one else would taste the lotus and forget about our destination. They embarked and sat along the rowing benches side by side and struck the grayish waters with their oars. With heavy hearts we sailed along and reached the country of the reckless Cyclops, lacking in customs. They put trust in gods, and do not plant their food from seed nor plough, and yet the barley, grain, and clustering wine grapes all flourish there, increased by rain from Zeus. They hold no councils, have no common laws, but live in caves on lofty mountain tops, and each makes laws for his own wife and children, without concern for what the others think. Our distance from this island is another, across the water, slantways from the harbor, level and thickly wooded. Countless goats live there, but people never visit it. No hunters labor through its woods to scale its hilly peaks. There are no flocks of sheep, 
no fields of plowland. It is all untilled, unsown, and uninhabited by humans. Only the bleating goats live there and graze. Cyclopic people have no red-cheeked ships, and no shipwright among them who could build boats to enable them to row across to other cities, as most people do, crossing the sea to visit one another. With boats they could have turned this island into a fertile colony, with proper harvests. But the grey shore there lie well-watered meadows where vines would never fail. There is flat land for ploughing, and abundant crops would grow in the autumn. There is richness underground. The harbour has good anchorage. There is no need of anchor stones or ropes or cables. The ships that come to shore there can remain beached safely till the sailors wish to leave and fair winds blow. Up by the harbor head, fresh water gushes down beneath the caves. The poplars grow around it. There we sailed. The gods were guiding us all through the darkness. Thick fog wrapped round our ships, and in the sky the moon was dark and clothed in clouds, so we saw nothing of the island. None of us could see the great waves rolling in towards the land, until we rowed right to the beach. We lowered all the sails and disembarked onto the shore, and there we fell asleep. When early dawn shone forth with rosy fingers, we roamed around that island full of wonders. On seeing mountain goats, we dashed to fetch our javelins and bows from aboard the ship. We split into three groups, took aim, and shot. We sat there all day till sunset, eating meat and drinking our strong red wine. The ship's supply of that had not run out. When we had sacked the holy citadel of the Sicones, we all took gallons of it, poured in great big pitchers. We took across the narrow strip of water at the Cyclopic Island, saw the smoke, and heard the bleating of their rams. The sun went down, and in the hours of darkness we lay and slept on shore beside the sea. But when the rosy hands of dawn appeared, I called my men together and addressed them. My loyal friends, stay here, the rest of you, while with my boat and crew I go to check who those men are, find out if they are wild, lawless aggressors, or the type to welcome strangers and fear the gods. With that I climbed on board and told my crew to come with me and then untie the cables of the ship. Quickly they did so, sat along the benches and struck the whitening water with their oars. The journey was not long. Upon arrival, right at the edge of land, beside the sea, we saw a high cave overhung with laurel, the home of several herds of sheep and goats. Around that cave was built a lofty courtyard of deep-set stones with tall pines rising up and leafy oaks. There lived a massive man who shepherded his flock all by himself. He did not go to visit other people, but kept apart and did not know the ways of custom. In his build he was a wonder, a giant, not like the men who live on bread, but like a wooded peak in airy mountains, rising alone above the rest. 
I told my loyal crew to guard the ship, while I would go with just twelve chosen men, my favorites. I took a goatskin full of dark sweet wine, a godlike drink. I filled a big skin up with it and packed provisions in a bag. My heart suspected that I might meet a man of courage, wild, and lacking knowledge of the normal customs. We soon were at the cave, but did not find the Cyclops. He was pasturing his flocks. We went inside and looked at everything. We saw his crates weighed down with cheese and pens crammed full of lambs. There were well-crafted bowls and pails for milking, all full of whey. My crew begged, let us grab some cheese and quickly drive the kids and lambs out of their pens and down to our swift ships and sail away across the salty water. That would have been the better choice, but I refused. I hoped to see him and find out if he would give us gifts. In fact, he brought no joy to my companions. Then we lit a fire and made a sacrifice and ate some cheese and sat to wait inside the cave until he brought his flocks back home. He came at dinner time and brought a load of wool to make a fire. He hurled it noisily into the cave. We were afraid and cowered towards the back. He drove his ewes and nannies inside to milk them. But he left the rams and he goats in the spacious yard outside. He lifted up the heavy stone and set it to block the entrance of the cave. It was a rock so huge and massive, twenty-two strong carts could not have dragged it from the threshold. He sat and, all in order, milked his ewes and she-goats. Then he set the lambs to suck beside each bleating mother. Then he curdled half of the fresh white milk, set it aside in wicker baskets and the rest he stored in pails so that he could drink it with his dinner. When he had carefully performed his chores, he lit a fire, then looked around and saw us. Strangers, who are you? Where did you come from, across the watery depths? Are you on business or roaming round with a ghoul like pirates? who risk their lives at sea to bring disaster to others. So he spoke, his voice so deep and booming, and his giant sighs made our hearts sink in terror. Even so, I answered, We are Greeks, come here from Troy. The winds have swept us off in all directions across the vast expanse of sea, off course from our planned route back home. Zeus willed it so. We are proud to be the men of Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, whose fame is greatest under the sky, for sacking that vast city and killing many people. Now we beg of you, here at your knees, to grant a gift, as is the norm for hosts and guests. Please, sir, my lord, respect the gods. We are your suppliants, and Zeus is on our side, since he takes care of visitors, guest friends, and those in need. Unmoved, he said. Well, foreigner, you are a fool, or from some very distant country. You order me to fear the gods. My people think nothing of that Zeus with his big scepter, nor any god. Our strength is more than theirs. If I spare you or spare your friends, it will not be out of fear of Zeus. I do the bidding of my own heart. I 
I do the beating of my own heart. But are you going far in that fine ship of yours, or somewhere near? He spoke to test me, but I saw right through him. I know how these things work. I answered him deceitfully. Poseidon, the Earthshaker, ship-tricked me at the far end of your island. He pushed us in. Wind dashed us on the rocks. We barely managed to survive. But he made no reply and showed no mercy. Leaping up high, he reached his hands toward my men, seized two and knocked them hard against the ground like puppies, and the floor was wet with brains. Devouring flesh, entrails, and marrow bones, and leaving nothing. Watching this disaster, we wept and lifted up our hands in prayer to Zeus. We felt so helpless. When the Cyclops had filled his massive belly with his meal of human meat and unmixed milk, he lay stretched out among his flocks. Then, thinking like a military man, I thought to get out my sword. Go up to him and thrust right through his torso, feeling for his liver. That would have doomed us all. On second thoughts, I realized we were too weak to move the mighty stone he set in the high doorway. So we stayed there in misery till dawn. Early the dawn appeared, pink fingers blooming. And then he let his fire and milked his ewes, in turn, and set a lamb by each one. When he had diligently done his chores, he grabbed two men and made a meal of them. After he ate, he drove his fat flock out. He rolled the boulder out and back with ease, as one would set the lid upon a quiver. Then, whistling merrily, the Cyclops drove his fat flocks to the mountain. I was left scheming to take revenge on him and harm him, and gain the glory if Athena let me. I made my plan. Beside the pen there stood a great big club, green olive wood, which he had cut to dry to be his walking stick. It was so massive that it looked to us like a ship's mast. I went and cut from it about a fathom and gave it to the men, and ordered them to scrape it down. They made it smooth, and I stood by and sharpened up the tip, and made it hard in a blazing flame. The cave was full of dung. I hid the club beneath a pile. Then I gave orders that the men cast lots for who would lift the stake with me and press it into his eye. One sweet sleep overtook him. The lots fell on the men I would have chosen. Four men, and I was fifth among their number.
That evening he drove back his woolly flocks into the spacious cave, both male and female, and left none in the yard outside, perhaps suspecting something, or perhaps a god told him to do it. He picked up and placed the stone to form a door, and sat to milk the sheep and bleating goats in turn, then put the little ones to suckle. His chores were done. He grabbed two men for dinner. I approached and offered him a cup of ivy wood filled full of wine, and said, Here, Cyclops, you have eaten human meat. Now drink some wine. Sample the merchandise our ship contains. I brought it as a holy offering, so you might pity me and send me home. But you are in a cruel rage, beyond what anyone could bear. Do you expect more guests when you have treated us so rudely? He took and drank the sweet, delicious wine. He loved it and demanded more. Another! And now tell me your name, so I can give you a present as my guest. One you shall like. My people do have wine. Grape clusters grow from our rich earth, fed well by rain from Zeus. But this is nectar. God food. So I gave him another cup of wine, then two more. He drank them all, unwisely. With the wine gone to his head, I told him, in all politeness, Cyclops, you asked my name. I will reveal it. Then you must give the gift you promised me of hospitality. My name is No Man. My family and friends all call me No Man. He answered with no pity in his heart, I will eat No Man last. First, I will eat the other men. That is my gift to you. Then he collapsed, fell on his back, and lay there, his massive neck askew. All conquering sleep took him. In drunken heaviness he spewed wine from his throat and chunks of human flesh. And then I drove the spear into the embers to heat it up, and told my men, Be brave. I wanted none of them to shrink in fear. The fire soon had seized the olive spear, green though it was and terribly it glowed. I quickly snatched it from the fire. My crew stood firm. Some god was breathing courage in us. They took the olive spear, its tip all sharp, and shoved it in his eye. I leaned on top and twisted it. He whirled. The fire-sharp weapon in his eye. His blood poured out around the stake, and blazing fire sizzled his lids and brows, and fried the roots. Horribly then he howled, the rocks resounded, and we shrank back in fear. He tugged the spear out of his eye, all soaked with gushing blood. Desperately, with both hands, he hurled it from him and shouted to the Cyclops who lived in caves, high up on the windy cliffs around. They heard, and came from every side, and stood near to the cave, and called out, 
Polyphemus, what is the matter? Are you badly hurt? Why are you streaming through the holy night and keeping us awake? Is someone stealing your herds? or trying to kill you by some trick or force? Strong Polyphemus from inside replied, My friends, no man is killing me by tricks, not force. Their words flew back to him. If no one hurts you, you are all alone. Great Zeus has made you sick. No help for that. Pray to your father, mighty lord Poseidon. Then off they went, and I laughed to myself at how my name, the No Man Maneuver, tricked him. The Cyclops groaned and labored in his pain, felt with blind hands and took the doorstone out and sat there at the entrance, arms outstretched to catch whoever went out with the sheep. Maybe he thought I was a total fool, but I was strategizing, hatching plans, so that my men and I could all survive. I wove all kinds of wiles and cunning schemes. Danger was near, and it was life or death. The best idea I formed was this. There were those well-fed, sturdy rams with good thick fleece, wool dark as violets, all fine, big creatures. 